What does it take to become a world champion in the beer mile? What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the YouTube channel. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I have a special guest. His name is Chris Robertson. He is a two-time beer mile world champion. He's the American record holder in the beer mile running 437, and he is the beer two-mile world record holder with a time of 10.18. He has also run very fast times on the track and on the roads. And we start off this episode by talking about his high school career here in Iowa City. And then we talk about his college career at Iowa State. And then for the rest of the episode, we talk about the beer mile. I don't wanna take up too much time because it's a great interview. I hope that you listen all the way through, but I know if you want to skip right to the beer miling part because that is probably the most interesting part and it'll be fun for you guys to learn about the sport of beer miling. I'll have the timestamps right below. Anyways, let's get into the interview and also inquiry of the episode. Again, I'm going to ask this one. I, I asked it last time. What would you like the series to be called? Let me know. I'd love to hear your suggestions. Anyways, let me know below what you want these interviews to be called. The next interview will be with Tin Man Elites, Brogan Austin. Enjoy, and I'll see you at the end of the video. Hey, Chris. Hey, what's going on? Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. How's my audio sound? Does it sound okay? Yeah, sounds pretty good. Are you using a microphone? Yeah, I've got a little mic here. So, yeah, and it's nice to have someone who has a podcast on because that means <laughs> all good audio. Yeah, for real. No, having a, even a cheap mic is better than just uh, using the computer. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I've got a bunch of questions about high school and college, and then we'll get into the beer mile uh, later into the interview, but let's just jump right in. Cool. And when did you first start running and what were your first impressions of the sport? I started running at a really young age. My dad uh, ran throughout his life. I guess he, he started when he was in his 20s, but uh, he ran a lot of road races around Iowa while I was growing up. And so I would always go to road races on weekends and, and watch him run as well as run in some of the like kids 50 yard dash and, and 100 meter dash and stuff like that. So, so I was definitely running in elementary school here and there. Uh, and then I would say late junior high is when I kind of really started taking it a lot more seriously. Uh, up until then, I really enjoyed basketball and soccer. Um, and I would probably have called those my favorite sports over running at the time. But then uh, everyone had growth spurts in like eighth and ninth grade and I didn't. And so I, uh, just stuck to running and, and yeah, especially in high schools took it, took it super seriously. And, um, originally I don't, I don't think running was, uh, you know, something that I loved, I guess in elementary school is kind of something that I did as a part of other sports, but then really, yeah, late junior high was when I, uh, started to get a lot faster and, and realized that it was pretty fun to compete and, uh, just see improvement over time. Yeah, definitely. So what did your training progression in high school look like? And to all the listeners out there that did not know this, Chris and I, uh, well, Chris went to City High School here in Iowa City, and that is where I go to high school as well. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, that's awesome that uh, we, we share the same high school. And I, uh, it's been fun to over the years after I graduated high school to still continue to follow follow along with the cross country and track results. And uh, especially now with social media, being able to follow the team on Instagram is it makes it a lot easier to follow. So, you know, it's awesome to see that a lot of the traditions are, are still living on and that uh, the team is still, still big and, and having fun. So, so that's excellent. I, uh, in junior high, um, I, I was definitely a lower mileage person um, earlier on. I kind of focused more on shorter stuff. And I, I wasn't a big fan of going on like super long runs. I was, I, I, I more enjoyed just going for a couple miles and running pretty fast at a time. 
and, and that's what I did a lot in junior high and early high school. Um, so I would say like freshman year of high school, I was probably only running maybe 30 miles a week, um, give or take. And then steady through high school, I think by senior year, I was maybe running 60 miles a week, kind of at like the peak, not even in the season, I was probably only around 50 to 55. So definitely not a, a high mileage person at all. Um, kind of focus more on quality over quantity uh, and making sure to take easy days um, a lot shorter and easier. But but yeah, it was just pretty steady. I'd say every every year in high school, just kind of add like 10 miles uh, per week, you know, each year and just have a nice uh, steady climb over time. And you were second place as a team at the state meet in 2008. And what yeah. were your high school PRs? Yeah, we unfortunately never won. Um, I, we, we had the team to win, I think, both in 2008, 2009. Um, unfortunately, well, 2008, we, yeah, we actually had a pretty good race at state um, and got, and got runner up. And in 2009, we had our best team ever, but that was the year where uh, there was swine flu, H1N1. So a lot of people were sick, um, including myself at the state meet. So my, my fastest time in cross country was 1601 for 5k um, senior year. And that was like in the middle of the season um, and then ended up getting sick and not being able, well, I ran reg or uh, districts and state, but did not go well. Um, so that was unfortunate to uh, kind of end on a bad note there from a, you know, a sickness standpoint, not getting the finish we wanted, but, uh, and then in track senior year, I ran nine, what was it? 931 for 3,200 and 428 for 1,600, I believe. Um, and that was a big improvement at the time. I, I wasn't, I didn't have really fast times, unfortunately, junior year. So like, as far as trying to go to college to run, I didn't really have that opportunity because I never, I don't, I think maybe junior year, I ran right around 10 flat, I believe in the 3,200. So not quite where I needed to be to you know, look seriously at like walking onto a D1 school or anything like that. Um, but then, yeah, senior year was able to, to drop a bunch of time and was pretty happy with the, where the times ended up. Just unfortunately never had great placings at state uh, individually. Like I think I could have, if I just had an A race on the right day. Yeah. The state meet is also just such a tough course with that start. You have to get out fast and yep. make that sharp turn. Absolutely. And you actually an just answered my next question was, uh, were those times good enough to be recruited out of high school? And then did you ever consider running D2 or D3? Yeah, uh, not quite, definitely not good enough to be recruited to D1. Uh, and es especially because my best times in track were in May of, of my senior year. So too late, I'd already decided on a school anyway. Uh, I did look at uh, Luther College for potentially going to and, and running D3, uh, but ultimately just ended up going to Iowa State because uh, academically it was a good fit for going into engineering school. And uh, I I knew going to Iowa State that I was going to try out for the team. And so I did try out for the team my freshman year. Uh, and basically my first week of school uh, at Iowa State, they had a just a time trial on the track, uh, 3,200 meter, and, and a few other guys showed up as well. And uh, basically they said, if you could run 920 for 3,200, like right here, right now, you get to walk onto the team. Um, and I did not, uh, I was like a super hot day. Uh, just, yeah, it, it would, it would have taken a perfect day for me to run 920. I don't even know if I was really a 920 shape and time trialing that by yourself in August, uh, is, is not the easiest thing either. So I was really bummed about that at first, uh, because running D1 is kind of something that I always thought I wanted to do and to see where I could go with running. But I think in hindsight, it ended up being the best thing for me just because running at the, like for the Iowa state running club and running at the club level, uh, I was able to spend a lot more time focusing on academics as well as I just met some awesome people in the running club as well. And it was still a, a like a, it was a perfect level of competition. Um, there were plenty of, plenty of guys for me to run with on the Iowa state campus that were, you know, as fast or faster than me that weren't on the D one team. So I, I had plenty of people to train with and push me and uh, it ended up all working out in the end. So really happy to, that I went that route, but, uh, but yeah, still would have loved to, um, you know, I, I wish I could also have known what the experience would have been like to run for a college team as well, because high school running for a team is, is an absolute blast um, being around everyone every day and having, having your, you know, your best friends to train with. So, uh, so yeah, I still, still wish I could have, maybe had that experience, but it worked out either way. Yeah. That's interesting to hear because running club always seems to get a bad 
reputation as being just a bunch of scrubs and yeah. <laughs> slow people. <laughs> and yep. you ended up you ended up being the president of the running club, if I read yeah. that correctly. And yeah. what was the experience like running club and what were your some of your favorite memories? Yeah, absolutely. I, I highly recommend club for anyone going to a D1 school that uh, you know, doesn't want to run on the team or, you know, if you're not quite fast enough to run the team, definitely recommend it. It's a blast. It's basically just every D1 school and, and some D2, I believe as well, but mostly D1 schools. It's, it's a bunch of people who still love running, still want to compete. Um, but either for, you know, for academic reasons, don't want to be on the team, um, you know, the time commitment, or they're not quite fast enough to be on the team, but there's still a bunch of guys that are, you know, sub 15 for 5k and club running scene, et cetera. And, and there's, it's still a regional and a national meet for running club every year for cross country and for track. And so I was still able to have a normal cross country season with, a, with our uh, team every fall and then have a normal, you know, indoor track and track season and road racing with in the spring. So it still felt the same as it would have felt on a, on a normal D one team. Uh, we, we still met for practice every day, met for workouts, uh, train to peak at the national cross country meet, uh, and, and compete there. And it, yeah, it, it was still, I feel like I still got a lot out of myself. Um, and, and was almost as fast as I probably could have been on the, on the team anyway. And, and it allowed me to enjoy it as well. And, and maybe avoid some injury too, by not overtraining. Um, so I think that, you know, best memories is just getting to go on, go on these trips with, with the team. And especially because once you're, so in high school, you have state and that's kind of your big meet that you travel for. But then in college, it's fun because you get to go around the U S for some of these races. So, um, I, I not only did the, the college club running, but then I would also do the USATF club cross country nationals every year as well with the team. So got to travel to a bunch of cities all over the U S and still compete. And so it still felt like it felt like it, you know, similar to what it would have on a, on a actual team as well. So just, just, uh, blast to have that team com- camaraderie and atmosphere. Yeah, that would be fun because it like anybody can be on the team just like in high school and anybody has the opportunity to continue running cross country and a lot of people enjoy it in high school yeah. and probably would like to keep running cross country but don't have the talent to run maybe D1. Exactly. So when was the first time that you heard about the beer mile? And then when did you actually first participate in one? Yeah, I think I heard about it in high school. I, I don't remember the exact first time. Uh, I think I heard about it in high school. It, it might, it might've been early college. Uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that, but I, the, the main introduction to it was uh, it's, it's pretty common for, for college teams to, do one uh, once a year, twice a year, just for kind of for bragging rights and for competing against your teammates. And um, so the club at Iowa State did one and I actually didn't compete in the first few um, when I was a freshman. Um, I I stayed away from drinking for a while. So absolutely did not drink in high school, (laughs) did not drink beginning of college. So I don't want to put off that impression. And uh, yeah, yeah, definitely don't don't be a mile in high school. so I just, I watched the first couple because it was still like a crazy, crazy thing. And I having not had any beer in my life at that point, other than like a couple sips to try it. I was like, I don't, I don't know what it would be like to drink four beers. I don't even know, you know, how one would sit. Cause I'd never, I'd never uh, done it before, but eventually in college I did do one. Uh, and it would, it didn't go amazing. It didn't go bad. Uh, I was just kind of, you know, pretty, pretty standard. Uh, but then just, by the time I was a senior in college, I had, for whatever reason, gotten faster at it. I still wasn't like taking it serious or anything. It was like I do one or two a year with friends and uh, just submitted my time to uh, beermile.com. And then like six months after I graduated college, got an email from Flowtrack and they were, they said, oh, we saw your result on beermile.com. Would you want to come to the Flowtrack World Championships? And uh, so, yeah, that was kind of my like, wow, there's actually a, a big race for this. So I'm going to go, go give it a shot and see what happens. Uh, so yeah, then from there, it's just kind of a matter of continuing to compete at the world championship race every year and just keep getting a little bit better at it every year as, uh, as I practice more. And yeah, that's pretty much it. It just kind of happened fluidly over time. It wasn't ever a conscious decision to, 
to say, oh, I, I think I could be a good beer miler. It just, it just kind of fell into place. Uh, and unfortunately, FlowTrack just was looking at results on, on the site and, and reached out because otherwise it would have, it would have never unfolded like it did. So could you walk us through the official beer mile rules for anyone watching that doesn't know? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, so it's four beers and four laps around the track. Um, the, the rule is the beer has to be at least 5% alcohol by volume. So you, you can't do light beers uh, and you can drink out of a bottle or a can. Um, and basically each lap you you have the, the nine meters between the mile start line and the finish line, and that's your chug zone. So you stop running, you grab your next beer and you chug it as fast as you can. And then once you're done, you run your next lap. Uh, so that's pretty much it. That's, that's it at a high level. And, and then there's, you know, more like further rules, like for official races around uh, the amount of alcohol that you can have left like in the bottle. So they'll measure what your, your foam remnants are at the, at the bottom of the bottle or they can and make sure you're under a certain amount um so there's a bunch of little rules like that but that's pretty much it at a high level and then there's a ton of variations of it too i know and i i haven't done any of these actually but like the chocolate milk mile same exact thing just doing four chocolate milks uh i've seen soda um pop um gatorade all, all yeah. sorts of different options there so so yeah there's also a bunch of variations where you can basically test to see if your stomach can handle that much you know fluid sloshing around while you're running a mile Actually, as we speak, a bunch of my teammates are at the John Raffensperger track doing a Gatorade mile. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Are they, are they doing, uh, I hope that they're, they're not doing like full Gatorade bottles. No, they're only time. doing, 12, doing 12, ounces. 12 ounces. Okay, yeah. good. I was going to say, that's a lot. <laughs> that's yeah. a lot of volume. <laughs> but I was pretty surprised. Some of my teammates had been sending in videos uh, of how fast that they could chug and they were they were doing them in six or seven seconds. Dang. So yeah, there'll be some, yeah. some good time then. Um, yeah. I'm curious to hear how everyone does. <laughs> <laughs> so you have run 413 in the mile, 1444 in the 5k, 108 in the half marathon and 224 in the marathon. What non beer related running achievement are you most proud of? And which do you feel is your strongest event? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think I've been pretty, I don't know. I, th I think I'm pretty equivalent across the spectrum to some extent. If anything, I would say like from a PR standpoint, my half marathon and marathon are the weakest just because the half marathon is very stale at this point. I haven't really peaked for a half marathon in a couple of years. And, and also in my last marathon, I almost ran as fast as my half marathon PR as a split. So so I think that one for sure I want to take down. And then the marathon um, was last fall trying to go for the Olympic trials qualifying time and was on, on 218 pace through 20 miles and just absolutely blew up. So, so it, it looks like 224 on paper is very disappointing to see just considering it's, I was like, so, so on the right day could have potentially even run, you know, 218 or 219. Um, so I think those two PRs, I, I have a lot of room for improvement on uh, and, and, Hopefully we'll give those a go uh, like a year from now, next fall. If, if marathons are on again, I, I would love to try to get, take another shot at qualifying for the Olympic trials. Uh, but really from a, just like a fun standpoint, I much prefer the shorter races. I really like racing the mile. Uh, I really like 5k. I really like doing track stuff. Um, especially because track was something I wasn't as good at in high school as cross country. I, I felt like I was just not, I didn't have a lot of speed, like a raw 400. I wasn't very fast at. Um, I was definitely a strength runner. So now after in college and then also after college, I, I focused a lot more on uh, build like speed and sprinting and uh, lifting weights to, to build more strength and power. And now that I can actually run decently fast, um, fast, at least compared to what I, I used to be able to run for hundred meters, 200 meters, 400 meters. Now that I can do that, then the track is a lot more fun and, and it's a lot more fun to be able to see how fast I can run a mile. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Going forward, I think I'll still continue to do a, a mix of everything from, from mile to marathon. Um, I'm, I'm even planning for 2021 to uh, sign up for the Pikes Peak Marathon and try my hand at a, a, a mountain race and see how that goes. Uh, because I've spent a, 
spent some time hiking and doing some runs in the mountains on vacations in the past. And I, my body seems to respond pretty well to it. So I'm just kind of curious what I could do for that as well. So I think I'll be trying everything next year, hopefully. I mean, assuming there are races, but if there aren't time trials and I'll probably try everything from mile up to, to mountain running and see, just kind of keep, keep seeing where my strengths are. Yeah. That'd be really interesting to see you run the Pikes Peak Marathon. That's a tough course too. Absolutely. <laughs> Plus you got to get good at downhill running. Yeah. That'd be, and, that and would I be think challenging. That might be, oh yeah. I, I think that might be my stronger suit over climbing just naturally, but, but either way, that's going to be the week after that race. I'm going to be so sore running downhill is just going to, that'll destroy my quads and, and calves and everything. So that, I'm not looking forward to that part of it. <laughs> so you compete for team USA beer mile, the team USA beer mile team. And is there really a team aspect of that or is it just people showing up? And if there is a team aspect, what is that compared to high school and club? Yeah, there's not really a team aspect, unfortunately. It's really uh, basically each summer ahead of the world championship race. Uh, everyone, uh, you know, does it does a beer mile wherever they're at in the U.S. and submits their time, their video, et cetera. And it's really just a matter of picking you know, who are the top five uh, guys and, and girls that are uh, looking to be the fastest for this year's world championship. So I'm the only person in, in Chicago that uh, has ever, you know, been on the team for that. It, it's mostly a lot of people are actually in California. Um, so no, there's not really a team aspect it, it, other than at the race itself and, and go, going to the race. It is a team competition as well as an individual. So there still is the, uh, the scoring, you know, country versus country. So in that sense, yeah, when we're, when we're at the meet, you know, it's, we're, we're, you know, warming up together, uh, you know, strategizing together, all of that sort of stuff. But, uh, but no, out, outside of the event itself, there's not, unfortunately not a, not really a team atmosphere on that uh, for the beer mile at all. It's, it's a very individual sport still. So how does one train for the beer mile? For, at this point, it's really just training for the mile. Uh, I I only do a couple beer miles a year. I don't I don't do a lot of them. I'm not I'm not uh, <laughs> drinking every day of the week. Believe me, um, because at this point, now that I've done it enough, I, I can pretty much you know drink anything out of a bottle as fast as it'll come out. You know whether that's water, beer, whatever whatever it is. So I can't really get any faster at at drinking. So it's just a matter of can I run faster, and that's. The difference between me and, and the world record holder is that the world record holder is a 357 miler and I'm, you know, 15 seconds slower. So that's where I just, I just need to train for the mile and continue, continue to get faster, hopefully shave off a few seconds. And uh, my splits for the, the chugging part are slightly faster than his. So if I can just get a little bit closer in the mile, then uh, potentially could have a shot at, at racing him and potentially getting a world record. But um, I, th I think that'll be something I try to shoot for again in the spring, but yeah, no, nothing. There's nothing uh, special to the beer. Once you have the chugging technique down, once you have that uh, and kind of just unlock, then it's a matter of just getting as fast as you can and training for the mile. Speaking of the chugging, is there a science to pouring the beer efficiently out of the bottle? There kind of is. Yes. If you want to. So the, the goal is to not get too much carbonation if you just take a, like a bottle or a can and just put it like vertical to pour it out it'll like the air bubbles will go up so it'll like glug 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 and that'll create uh the all the excess foam and carbonation and so ideally you kind of want to keep the bottle as parallel to the ground as possible to start um and then like slowly tilt it back um so that way there's always like a slight air pocket uh towards the neck of the bottle, like going down to the, the main part of the bottle. Um, and if you do that, then there, there will pretty much be no foam that gets created as a part of it. And so your stomach then isn't, doesn't have so much carbonation in it and it's not uh, so upset as well as then you don't risk getting disqualified for having the extra, extra beer in the bottle at the end. So, so yeah, it's just keeping it, keeping it kind of parallel with the ground to start and then just like slowly raising it as the, as the liquid's emptying. You were on the front page of Let's Run a few weeks ago, um, and which is a very cool opportunity. But what are some of your other like what what are some of the coolest opportunities that you've gotten from 
beer miling. Yeah. Uh, man, I'm trying to think. Yeah, making Let's Run is <laughs> that's, that's fun stuff. Um, I, yeah, I think getting to go to the Flow Track headquarters was awesome and, and running the Flow Track beer miles when they had those. They only did that for three years, uh, 20, 2014 to 2016, I believe, were the three years. Maybe they did four. I can't remember. But, uh, but yeah, getting to go to the Flow Track headquarters and meet um, like Ryan Fenton and all the kind of the founders of Flow Track was, was a pretty cool opportunity. Um, I mean, meeting like Nick Simmons, for example, I met met or we we know of each other we don't like know each other personally but know of each other through the beer mile basically leading into one of the flow track meets he uh sent you know run gum like free run gum samples and the run gum hat to all the people that would be competing to help you know uh advertise for him and, and stuff like that so so definitely the people i've gotten to meet is is probably the the biggest uh the biggest bonus of it all and, and getting to travel internationally and meet meet other runners from other countries and spend time with them and, and, uh, compete with them. That's, that's, I think that's probably been the, the, the biggest thing, um, got and getting to do uh, podcasts, uh, and, and shows and stuff like this is also a blast yeah. too. I, uh, <laughs> I've done, I've done a few now, still not a lot, but, uh, I think, uh, the plan is to hopefully do a uh, Sidious mag this week as well, which that'll be a, a fun one to be on, I think. And, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully from here, I, I just would love to continue to get to meet more and more pro runners and, and talk to them and hear their story and kind of like kind of like what uh, you're doing as well, getting to interview like Jake Riley. And that's awesome. That's that's uh, I want to do a similar thing and just get to meet a lot more people and have a lot more people to, to run with when I you know travel to different cities in the in the U.S. and throughout the world. Yeah, it was cool to see your interview yesterday with Nick Simmons. Honestly, that was probably like one of the best running interviews that I've seen in a really long time. So I was fully engaged. It was really <laughs> interesting. And I'm sure that when you first started Beer Mile and you did not expect to get to go to the, get to go to Europe to compete. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely not. No, I did. I did not think that would, uh, that would ever be a thing. So <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's been a great, uh, a great blessing that I wasn't expecting to have. <laughs> So you were the 2017 and 2020 Beer Mile champion. What did it take to win those races and describe the days leading up to the races, the emotions before, after, during, and lastly, what is your Beer Mile strategy? Yeah, the both it's, yeah, it's been, it's been awesome to win both times. Uh, the, the, it, it's really a battle, um, I, I will say that the two years that I won, um, the current world record holder was not at those races. So that definitely, you know, helped, helped out a little bit with having an advantage there. Um, but yeah, in 2017 in London, uh, I, that was the first, I guess that was, that was the first time I felt like pretty confident, I guess, going in, uh, that, that was basically my third year competing and the years before that, I still kind of felt like a newbie. Like I didn't really know, I didn't really know all the technique stuff. I didn't have the chugging down. I, so I wasn't ever going in there saying like, man, I have a shot at winning this. I was really just, you know, going in there, just kind of doing what I could and, and seeing how it turned out. And so yeah, 2017 in London was, was uh, that first time where I went in like, man, I, I should win this if I do everything right. And uh, I, I remember that, specifically that week, not feeling the best, I'd probably just jet lag and, and whatnot for flying, flying over to London a couple of days before the race and, and everything. But, but yeah, it, was, it kind of just like racing. I mean, racing anything, when you're having those good races, you're just in that, that kind of that flow state and you're not really thinking about anything. You're just getting the most out of yourself. And so there wasn't really anything that I remember that I was like conscious of during the race or like thinking about it, it was just, just kind of letting it happen. Uh, and and so, yeah, that was having that first victory there, um, even though it wasn't even my PR or anything, but just having that, that first, uh, you know, good, like actual race setting under my belt was, was awesome. And then going in after that, it was always like, I expected to be close to the front or, or trying to win. So just kind of changes the mindset and a new level of confidence. And so this year in 2020 was really interesting, just being, being a virtual race and, you essentially had one week to do unlimited attempts. You could do as many attempts you wanted to and just submit your fastest one. And so 
I figured I might as well try it mate, roughly every other day, similar to if you have a track track meets or something. And it's like you race a mile one day and maybe two days later you're racing another mile. I kind of figured if I'm only doing a mile at a time, I can probably swing every other day and not be, you know, too sore and, and everything like that. So, uh, so yeah, I did three of them and just so happened the third one was the best. Uh, and it was just, it's just such a weird feeling, not basically doing a time trial by yourself and having someone there watching and filming, but not having anyone to compete against it. It's a whole different level. It, it, there was a lot less, I guess, a lot less nerves and, and pressure and all that sort of stuff because I'm just running against myself. Um, but at the same time, I miss the, I miss the competitive atmosphere and the nerves and, and all of that. I think it helps you race a lot faster than you, than you would by yourself. At least it does for me. So, uh, but, but yeah, it was, it was also nerve wracking too for 2020 because you, we all submitted our times, but they didn't tell us who won until like the day they were releasing the race. Um, so there was the whole like week period where the, the race directors knew the results, but they just weren't telling anybody. So it was just, it was kind of crazy to like have done the race and feel really good about it. Like, Oh, I set a big PR, but no idea if that is going to be good enough or like if I should have tried again, or I, it, it's a weird, it's a very weird uh, setup. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's the setup again for 2021. So if it is, I'll just make the best of it and, and do something similar to what I did this year for strategy. But uh, yeah, I mean, le leading leading into any of those races is really no different than leading into any other peak race, peak mile, et cetera, really just uh, taking a couple of easy days running beforehand. And then even, even eating wise, it's the same strategy of just you want to make sure you're fueled up, but not necessarily eating something within a couple hours of the race, just so your stomach is, you know, not full. You don't have anything in there, but uh, yeah, I don't treat it any differently than I would treat just going into a, a one mile race on the track. It's pretty much the exact same preparations for, for that. Yeah. I remember watching this year's virtual race and first of all, the announcers were pretty funny. They were. But, uh, you were racing on a track that was very busy and I remember you were coming around maybe like the third lap and there was a scooter in lane one or something like that. And you were very close to tripping over a soccer ball at one point. <laughs> what was this like? What, what was going in your head during that race? Yeah, the yeah, the track that's uh, I, I live in the city of Chicago and there's a public track that's only like a half mile away, which is awesome. It's great for being able to go over there and work out. But it is always packed with people being in the city and a lot of people that aren't at the track to use the track. So they're not, they don't have any sort of track etiquette or anything like that. They're there for playing soccer on the infield or whatever the case may be. And there's a lot of kids who are there with their parents, their parents are playing soccer in the middle and the kids are just biking around and scooting around. So you never know what you're going to get at this track. Um, so I, I don't know, I guess at this point, I, I'm just kind of used to it. I kind of expect it. And, uh, yeah, there's certainly, there certainly could have been major issues if, if someone doesn't get out of the way or you actually run into someone and it completely stops your momentum, that would be pretty, pretty devastating. But uh, fortunately, yeah, able to weave around uh, and, and get, get around everyone for the most part. Um, and st still kind of in the race, uh, in those attempts for the, for the virtual beer mile, still did a pretty good job of getting into getting into like a flow state and not really thinking about like, we're not worrying about that. Um, just kind of taking it as it comes and yeah, weaving around someone, but then just forgetting about it, not, not dwelling on it or anything. Uh, felt like I was, I felt like I did a pretty good job of that this time around as well. Just keeping focused on, on doing my best and whatever, whatever happens, happens. You are the American record holder in the beer mile with a time of 437, which is very impressive. But I think what impresses me the most is that your mile PR is 413, which is only a 24 second difference. Yet you still manage to slow down, grab and open a bottle, chug the beer, start running and repeat that four times in 24 seconds. How is this possible? <laughs> I think, I think it's possible because I think my mile PR maybe is a little, it should be faster. I think, um, I don't know. I've actually wondered that myself. Why, why, or how exactly my running doesn't get affected, I guess. I, I think if I were to do a mile outright on like an outdoor track in a race, uh, I think I could probably be more in like, like the 408 to 409 range would be my guess. It's, it's really hard when you're, 
especially post collegiate, you don't really have many opportunities to race on the track. And the only real, only, only real meets that I can get into unattached uh, around here are indoor meets. And so I'll, I'll run the mile indoor, but it's in February. So it's hard to do track training and it's, uh, uh, obviously on a tight 200 meter track. And so I'll, I, I've just never had a good opportunity in the last few years to really go for a fast mile PR. So one, I think 413 might be slightly slower than what I could run. Um, maybe five seconds or so would be my guess. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess at this point, I think, I think one thing that helps weirdly enough is that the, the beers, even though you do slow down and stop and, and have to start again, I think just the, mentality and adrenaline of only focusing on one lap at a time versus in a mile, you're just, I guess you're, you, you, you know, that you have four laps ahead of you and you're going without any sort of interruption. The beer mile is really good at just breaking things down in little chunks and saying, okay, I just need to get through this lap. Okay. I just need to drink this beer. Okay. I just need to get through this lap. And so I don't know, I think maybe there's something to just the, uh, the mental aspect of that and kind of the adrenaline of after chugging a beer and then taking off sprinting on the next lap. And just, I don't know, it, it's, it's enough that where your mind almost gets distracted from how bad the running hurts that you like, don't really, I don't really think about like, Oh, what was my split or, or, Oh, my, my legs are dying. I'm just kind of like every lap, just run, just sprint, run as fast as I can see what happens and uh, take it one lap at a time. So maybe, it, maybe it's partly just the kind of the mentality aspect of it. What does your family think about, you competing in the beer mile. I'd imagine they'd be very proud. <laughs> yeah, they know they think it's pretty, they think it's pretty fun. Uh, and yeah, my, I mean, my parents will, will tell all of their friends and, and all of that and they'll, they'll watch the races. So no, yeah, they, they definitely think it's pretty, pretty fun to watch. <laughs> uh, the sport of beer miling has become a lot more competitive over the last decade. Are you surprised at how, competitive, serious, and professional it has become? I think, I don't think I'm too surprised by it. I think uh, as more people have just found out about it over time and have tried it, uh, it makes sense that some, there are going to be some natural talents that discover that they're pretty good at it. And especially because most of the time in the beer mile, you know, four, four minutes and, and 13 seconds of the four minutes and 37 seconds are, are running. Uh, th pretty much anyone who can run a low four mile or, you know, pros that are running 350 for the mile, if they're able to, to chug it all, they can run super fast beer miles. Uh, so I think that there's still a lot of, a lot of people out there who, uh, especially pro runners that could discover that they're actually really good at it. And so we could even see more, you know, 430 times and 420 times in the coming years, if, if they choose to, if people choose to try it, I don't know which pros would be good at it, or maybe they wouldn't be that great just because of the stomach, you know, piece of it. But, uh, but no, I, I think just because it's kind of grown in popularity over time, I'm not overly surprised. Um, just there's more, more people to pull from and more people have tried it. And so there's a, yeah, just a bigger pool of talent at this point. Yeah. It would be really interesting to see how fast some of the elite professional runners could run a beer mile. Yeah. But let's talk about beermile.com, which are you, you, are you the host of that? Yeah. So that's a recent thing, actually. Uh, beermile.com was founded in the nineties and just uh, a little over a month ago. Now uh, a friend and I basically decided to, to, to purchase that we've been talking to the, the founder of it and he's kind of operated it all these years but he doesn't really have a whole lot of time to dedicate to it and updating it, et cetera, uh, because he has other jobs and projects and children and, and everything else. So uh, he was kind of looking for someone to, to buy it and revamp it and everything. So we decided to, to, to buy it from him. And, and yeah, that's the, the plan is to uh, basically give it a complete refresh look add a lot of new uh, like features and capabilities on there. Things like, um, like at the core, it'll still be, you know, seeing records, seeing results and all that, but having a lot more kind of like a newsfeed style, similar to like an Instagram or Twitter, where you can see recent beer mile results that have been posted and watch the videos for it. You can vote on, you know, whether you think it was like official and legit or not, um, ability to, you know, uh, have a profile and share and follow others and post and all that good stuff. We have a lot of ideas for it. Uh, and so a big part of that as well is, 
you know, starting the podcast and, and starting the YouTube channel and trying to, trying to just uh, have a lot more avenues for um, connecting with people and, and growing an audience and, and putting out some hopefully funny and entertaining content. Uh, at least it's fun for us to make. So uh, at a minimum, that's, you know, I guess that it, it's worth doing uh, as long as we're having fun doing it. Um, but yeah, that, that's the, that's the story behind it. It's very new. Uh, and we, yeah, we're official owners of it now. And hopefully a lot of cool things to come to the, to the website coming forward and even doing more things like highlighting other beer mile variations, like a Gatorade mile or chocolate milk mile and making it a lot more of a, um, a friendly sport across a number of different challenges for, you know, for a number of age groups too, not just, not just focusing on the one, the beer mile itself and nothing else. Yeah, I was just wondering about that because I saw results from the 90s and I saw a result that was from Iowa City in 2007 that only had two competitors and both of them DNF'd <laughs> and some good looking merch too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully a lot more to come. So now I have some questions that the viewers have asked you on Instagram awesome. as well as some rapid fire questions. And you can answer these in as much or as little detail as you want. Cool. So which was harder, your 224 marathon or the 437 beer mile? Oh, man. The 224 marathon hurt. Uh, when, when a marathon starts hurting and you're hurting pretty bad and you still have like 45 minutes left to run, it's pretty miserable. So I'll say the, I'll say the marathon was, uh, was a lot harder, a lot more, a lot more painful. <laughs> Two people ask this question. The first person said, quote, what is your favorite beer, LOL? And then another person said, what's his favorite beer? <laughs> I, I like a wide variety of beers. Uh, a, one that comes to mind that's like a nicer, a nicer beer is called Delirium Tremens. Um, it, yeah, it's not, not something that I would drink super often, but I think it's kind of like a, it's really good tasting, like celebratory type, type beer to have once in a while. Uh, but honestly, Blue Moon tastes pretty good. I, I would, I don't mind drinking that just casually as well once in a while. So yeah, I, I kind of like a little bit of everything, to be honest. What advice do you have for all the high school runners out there who want to get into beer miling? <laughs> Don't do it until you're 21. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, I, yeah, like I said, I, I did not drink in high school, did not drink at the beginning of college either. Um, so def don't recommend it, like be responsible about it. Don't break the law. Um, I, I mean, I think if it, you know, if it does intrigue you and you want to try it someday, uh, you know, wait till it's the right time and, and definitely give it a try. But I, I think, you know, in the meantime, I think that like the Gatorade mile or variations like that are, would be fun little competitions. Uh, and I, and you know, and a good, a good example of that, I think on YouTube is Nick Simmons, just posting all the wide variety of, um, crazy challenges he's done and, and, uh, you know, going after a lot of those, if, if, if you really would say, Oh, one day I want to maybe compete in the beer mile. Uh, I think practicing some of those things now might just get your, get your stomach and your, your running prepared for that, but just keep training, keep running, keep running is the main thing. Or you could go for the Wendy's four for four blue jean basketball mile. I saw that. That was <laughs> awesome. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll try to come up with some some random combinations of things like that, and then see. Uh, yeah, see if I can get clever with it and, and have some fun over the next few months. <laughs> what do you envision for the sport of beer mile of the beer mile in the next ten years? That's a great question. I, I, I wonder that myself. I, I think it could kind of go either way. I think it could kind of stay kind of like it is now just a niche thing. Like maybe there's a championship race every year, but still, you know, relatively under the radar, like people know of it and hear about it, but not necessarily that it's mainstream. I could definitely see that being the case. I could potentially see, and, and maybe this would require like some pro runners trying it, but you know, maybe if there is some crazy, like a time where there's like a bunch of people running 420 or something absolutely crazy, you know, maybe it does get picked up by ESPN or, or some other network and, and it does get a lot bigger. Uh, I could honestly see it going either way. Even if, even if it stays a niche sport, just kind of at your local level, you, you know, do it for fun with your clubs and, and whatnot. I think that still is still successful in my mind and, and still, uh, still promoting the, you know, the team camaraderie and, and, 
going to the track together with your, with your teammates or with your club or whatever, and just having fun with it. I think that still would be a success in my mind. Yeah. ESPN definitely needs to pick it up. If they can have the hot dog eating competition every year and they usually have the spelling bee too, I think they could have the beer mile. Absolutely. They also have like, like bags, the corner. Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think, I mean, part of it, obviously you don't want to promote, binge drinking um four beers but but yeah like the hot dog eating thing i don't think you want to promote eating 70 hot dogs either so it's just it is what it is i don't know it would be it would be cool if they would would pick it up and even put it on one of the secondary espns or even if it's on at midnight or something just have it on at some point that would be that'd be awesome do you think a sub four beer mile is possible and what do you think the limit to where the beer mile world record could go is I'd say under current current human capabilities and without some crazy shoes or anything like that, no, no on the four minute beer mile. It it takes the amount of time it takes the liquid just to come out of the the container uh, is like say five or six seconds, and so uh, that would put someone running the mile under three forty, and I don't think that's gonna happen in our lifetimes probably uh, without crazy you know drugs or or um, crazy like leg like robot legs whatever the case may be but i think that someone could definitely run 420 maybe even a little under if they're running like a 355 mile um and in flawlessly getting all the beers down i think uh sub 420 could be possible which would be absolutely insane <laughs> yeah that. Now, it's be. not gonna be by me because i'm not gonna <laughs> run a 355 mile so you can count me out for that i, I i'll go for the low 430s but I, I i don't i don't think i'll ever be running a 355 mile in my life well, speaking about the crazy shoes, do you think the carbon fiber plate shoes and the alpha flies and the vapor flies, do you think they should be banned? I don't know. I, that's a great question. I, I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, definitely the, the unfair aspect now that the vapor flies are kind of available publicly, anyone can buy them. Um, I don't think it's as much of an issue as long as everyone has access to them. I I don't think that banning technology is a good idea. Uh, It's more just about making it an even playing field at the, at the time. So I think the big issue is for the pro runners that are under a contract with a certain shoe sponsor and their shoe sponsor just doesn't have the technology built. And so it's not fair in that case. Um, So I don't really know what the best rules are on that, but uh, I will say, I mean, having run in the, the vapor flies, the next, the alpha flies, all of them. I mean, they're pretty fun to run in. They, you definitely do. They do make a difference over the long, long races for sure. Just you're, you don't feel uh, like the day after running a marathon in those versus the day after running a marathon in like flats uh, a couple of years ago, just the, the level of soreness is completely different. And so with that regard, it's pretty fun. And it, it, it in, Yes, it's harder to compare times today than to, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, but as long as it's, as long as there's a way to make an even, even playing field, you know, within the same race, uh, from my perspective, I think it's, that's fine. Yeah. I definitely would like to try the carbon fiber plate shoes, but, uh, I don't know how much I like how, uh, how prominent I guess they are now and how often you see them in races and how, if you see, go to a road race, you see just like a whole lot of, neon yep yep i yeah it especially especially if you don't have them it's it's almost like you have to have them to in order to like compete now which is yeah it is kind of a bummer um i guess that's the good thing about cross country and track is uh it's they're not really as well obviously in cross country they're not prominent on the track i don't think they're i think the spikes are still still faster option there. Um, so at least for those at this point, uh, it's, it's a little bit more even of a playing field, but, uh, yeah, it, it's, they're crazy, crazy shoes for sure. Um, I, they're, they're not something I would recommend training in very often just because you, because they take so much of the force off your lower legs and, and everything, it's almost like you're not training to the level you should be because they're doing, doing some of the work for you. And it's just not as natural of a running gait as, uh, as you would, if you were running barefoot. And so I, I don't, I tried to very rarely, I'll wear them for like a workout, a big workout, like once in a while in, in a big training cycle, but I try to avoid them as much as possible and just kind of wear standard shoes to, to make sure that my, you know, my legs still actually know how to run fast on their own without the shoes. 
what do you do and what do you like to do besides running and running with beer? Yeah. Oh man. A lot of stuff. Um, I, so I, I love making videos. That's actually something I did a lot growing up as well in, in high school. Um, and kind of didn't do it as much looking back as much as I should have in, in college and after college. And so now it's been a lot of fun to get back into that. And, uh, and, you know, I, I, I think I, you submitted, you, do they still have the film festival at city high? Yes, they do. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I did that like in, at city high and, and submitted stuff to the film festival. And I, that was an absolute blast. So, um, so making videos, super fun. Uh, unfortunately I spend most of my time working on <laughs> my, my actual job. So, uh, so that's definitely takes up the majority of my time. Um, definitely work a lot, but, but enjoy what I do there. Uh, I think traveling is the other huge thing that I, that I love to do. I love to uh, especially go to like national parks, go find new trails, um, really like going uh, out West and, and going to new places and running and, and hiking and all of that. So if I, yeah, if I could have like my perfect, perfect day, it would be, uh, you know, waking up somewhere around trails or in the mountains and, and just going for a run and hiking and, and uh, capturing some video of it along the way. And I think that would, that's, that's kind of my, my ideal day is spending time outdoors and, and running and hiking. Yeah. And your animation skills are pretty good too, as, <laughs> as you can see on the Beer Mile <laughs> podcast intro. Yep. So I, more... I spent a lot of time with uh, After Effects in, 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 uh, in high school. And so still kind of remember what I'm doing. <laughs> so two more questions. Uh, the first question is, Will you be back for Legend of the Fall? I mean, I think this year it got canceled, but will uh, you be back again? I I will definitely be back again. Yeah, I that's a that's a bummer. I I I think I don't know if you, yeah, I don't know if I'll be back this year on Thanksgiving Day yet. TBD, but absolutely I need to be back for Legend of the Fall um, because that, I love that race. Hickory Hill is my favorite place to run in the Iowa City area. It's a blast. Yeah, last year my bro my older brother won the race and he was really excited when he found out that you weren't there <laughs> oh man <laughs> but, but maybe one day he uh he will be competitive with you that would be great yeah i would i would love that yeah i'd love to love to have a good race with him and if he beats me he beats me that'd be, yeah, that'd be awesome. we almost had the one two max uh finish and then i got out kicked and got third oh no <laughs> <laughs> on spicy <laughs> Man, all right. Well, you'll have to you'll have to redeem yourself then. Uh, then what, next time we have it, if it's not this year, then next year have to yeah. have to give it a go again. So, last question: what What is next for Chris Robertson? Yeah, uh, hopefully ma- making a bunch of hopefully entertaining and stupid videos. Hopefully interviewing uh, some cool pro runners. Uh, that it's kind of the the non-running the creative side of things and then from a running standpoint really don't know i don't know what races will happen if any will happen and so probably i'll just try to get some good base mileage in this winter maybe do some some time trials and like 5k 10k in the spring uh if there aren't races and then yeah next summer i think i'm going to try to spend as much time uh training for hike speak marathon as possible so and, and as well as I'll, I'll obviously do the beer mile again next summer too, when, whenever that is and whether it's virtual or not, but, but yeah, I got some time now, got a few, a few months of no plans and hopefully just running some good mileage, staying healthy and, and getting, getting the base there for, for whenever I need to start training seriously and doing, doing more workouts again. Well, thank you for coming on today. I will link in the description, uh, all of your socials and the link to the podcast. Awesome. But anything awesome. else you want to say to all of the fall, all of the subscribers? <laughs> oh man, I'd say just uh, I, it's it's awesome to to get to have the chance to talk to you and see you know talk to someone up and coming and at City High and running cross country as well and also making videos. So it's been yeah, it's been awesome. Thanks for having me on and uh, definitely just to everyone out there, just keep enjoying running. It's it's an absolute blast. Don't don't take it too seriously. Train hard, but just, just enjoy it along the way. And if you, if you do that, you're going to keep getting better over time and, and keep having the motivation to get out the door. So, so yeah, it's, it's a great way to meet people. Great. It's great for your health. And also just, uh, it's fun to see progress over time as well. So, uh, 
yeah, just keep after it and keep chasing goals. Thank you, Chris. Hey guys, thank you for watching all the way through. I hope you enjoyed. I thought it was super interesting and thank you so much, Chris, for joining me on the channel. It was a lot of fun and I had a great time, some good laughs, and I hope that you guys all enjoyed it as much as I did. Again, let me know below what you want the series to be called, and I will seriously consider your suggestion. As always, thank you for Todd Father because Todd Father helped me get some stuff set up. So thank you, Todd Father, and you know he has a message for all of you, and he wants to share his message with you guys. Don't do it until you're 21. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, I, yeah, like I said, I, I did not drink in high school, did not drink at the beginning of college either. Um, so definitely don't recommend it. Like be responsible about it. Don't break the law. So thank you so much for watching. Live life to the max, run to the max. I'll see you in the next video. The next video will be the state meet. I still got to get it edited. And if you are watching all the way through, that means you are either Todd father, Laura mother, or you are just an awesome subscriber. So thank you so much. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.